Chapter Two, Part One of The Haunted Man and the Ghost's Bargain by Charles Dickens. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Gift Diffused, Part One. A small man sat in a small parlour partitioned off from a small shop by a small screen pasted all over with small scraps of newspapers. In company with the small man was almost any amount of small children you may please to name, at least it seemed so. They made, in that very limited sphere of action, such an imposing effect in point of numbers. Of these small fry, two had, by some strong machinery, been got into bed in a corner, where they might have reposed snugly enough in the sleep of innocence, but for a constitutional propensity to keep awake, and also to scuffle in and out of bed. The immediate occasion of these predatory dashes at the waking world was the construction of an oyster-shell wall in a corner by two other youths of tender age, on which fortification the two in bed made harassing descents, like those accursed Picts and Scots who beleaguer the early historical studies of most young Britons, and then withdrew to their own territory. In addition to the stir attendant on these inroads, and the retorts of the invaded, who pursued hotly and made lunges at the bedclothes under which the marauders took refuge, another little boy in another little bed contributed his mite of confusion to the family stock by casting his boots upon the waters, in other words, by launching these and several small objects inoffensive in themselves though of a hard substance considered as missiles, at the disturbers of his repose, who were not slow to return these compliments. Besides which, another little boy, the biggest there but still little, was tottering to and fro, bent on one side, and considerably affected in his knees by the weight of a large baby, which he was supposed, by a fiction that obtains sometimes in sanguine families, to be hushing to sleep. But, oh, the inexhaustible regions of contemplation and watchfulness into which this baby's eyes were then only beginning to compose themselves to stare over his unconscious shoulder. It was a very Moloch of a baby, on whose insatiate altar the whole existence of this particular young brother was offered up a daily sacrifice. Its personality may be said to have consisted in its never being quiet in any one place for five consecutive minutes, and never going to sleep when required. Tetterby's baby was as well known in the neighbourhood as the postman or the pot-boy. It roved from doorstep to doorstep in the arms of little Johnny Tetterby, and lagged heavily at the rear of troops of juveniles who followed the tumblers or the monkey, and came up all on one side a little too late for everything that was attractive from Monday morning until Saturday night. Wherever childhood congregated to play, there was little Moloch making Johnny fag and toil. Wherever Johnny desired to stay, little Moloch became fractious and would not remain. Whenever Johnny wanted to go out, Moloch was asleep and must be watched. Whenever Johnny wanted to stay at home, Moloch was awake and must be taken out. Yet Johnny was verily persuaded that it was a faultless baby, without its peer in the realm of England, and was quite content to catch meek glimpses of things in general from behind its skirts or over its limp flapping bonnet, and to go staggering about with it like a very little porter with a very large parcel which was not directed to anybody and could never be delivered anywhere. The small man who sat in the small parlour, making fruitless attempts to read his newspaper peaceably in the midst of this disturbance, was the father of the family, and the chief of the firm described in the inscription over the little shop-front, by the name and title of A. Tetterby and Co. Newsmen. Indeed, strictly speaking, he was the only personage answering to that designation, as Co. was a mere poetical abstraction, altogether baseless and impersonal. 
Tetterby's was the corner shop in Jerusalem Buildings. There was a good show of literature in the window, chiefly consisting of picture newspapers out of date, and serial pirates and footpads. Walking sticks, likewise, and marbles were included in the stock in trade. It had once extended into the light confectionery line, but it would seem that those elegancies of life were not in demand about Jerusalem buildings, for nothing connected with that branch of commerce remained in the window except a sort of small glass lantern containing a languishing mass of bull's-eyes, which had melted in the summer and congealed in the winter until all hope of ever getting them out or of eating them without eating the lantern too was gone for ever. Tetterby's had tried its hand at several things. It had once made a feeble little dart at the toy business, for in another lantern there was a heap of minute wax dolls, all sticking together upside down in the direst confusion, with their feet on one another's heads and a precipitate of broken arms and legs at the bottom. It had made a move in the millinery direction, which a few dry, wiry bonnet shapes remained in a corner of the window to attest. It had fancied that a living might lie hidden in the tobacco trade, and had stuck up a representation of a native of each of the three integral portions of the British Empire in the act of consuming that fragrant weed, with a poetic legend attached, importing that in one cause they sat and joked, one chewed tobacco, one took snuff, one smoked but nothing seemed to have come of it except flies. Time had been when it had put a forlorn trust in imitative jewellery, for in one pane of glass there was a card of cheap seals, and another of pencil cases, and a mysterious black amulet of inscrutable intention labelled ninepence. But to that hour Jerusalem buildings had bought none of them. In short, Tetterby's had tried so hard to get a livelihood out of Jerusalem buildings in one way or other, and appeared to have done so indifferently in all, that the best position in the firm was too evidently Coe's. Coe, as a bodiless creation, being untroubled with the vulgar inconveniences of hunger and thirst, being chargeable neither to the poor's rates nor the assessed taxes, and having no young family to provide for. Tetterby himself, however, in his little parlour, as already mentioned, having the presence of a young family impressed upon his mind in a manner too clamorous to be disregarded, or to comport with the quiet perusal of a newspaper, laid down his paper, wheeled in his distraction a few times round the parlour like an undecided carrier pigeon, made an ineffectual rush at one or two flying little figures in bedgowns that skimmed past him, and then, bearing suddenly down upon the only unoffending member of the family, boxed the ears of little Moloch's nurse. "'You bad boy,' said Mr. Tetterby, "'haven't you any feeling for your poor father after the fatigues and anxieties of a hard winter's day since five o'clock in the morning? But must you wither his rest and corrode his latest intelligence with your wicious tricks? Isn't it enough, sir, that your brother Dolphus is toiling and moiling in the fog and cold, and you rolling in the lap of luxury with a, with a baby and everything you could wish for?' said Mr. Tetterby, heaping this up as a great climax of blessings. But must you make a wilderness of home and maniacs of your parents? Must you, Johnny, eh? At each interrogation Mr. Tetterby made a feint of boxing his ears again, but thought better of it and held his hand. Oh, father, whimpered Johnny, when I wasn't doing anything, I'm sure, but taking such care of Sally and getting her to sleep. Oh, father! Oh, I wish my little woman would come home, said Mr. Tetterby, relenting and repenting. I only wish my little woman would come home. I ain't fit to deal with them. They make my head go round and get the better of me. Oh, Johnny, isn't it enough that your dear mother has provided you with that sweet sister? indicating Moloch. 
isn't it enough that you were seven boys before without a ray of gal and that your dear mother went through what she did go through on purpose that you might all of you have a little sister but must you so behave yourself as to make my head swim softening more and more as his own tender feelings and those of his injured son were worked on mr tetterby concluded by embracing him and immediately breaking away to catch one of the real delinquents a reasonably good start occurring he succeeded after a short but smart run and some rather severe cross-country work under and over the bedsteads and in and out among the intricacies of the chairs in capturing his infant whom he condignly punished and bore to bed this example had a powerful and apparently mesmeric influence on him of the boots who instantly fell into a deep sleep though he had been but a moment before broad awake and in the highest possible feather nor was it lost upon the two young architects who retired to bed in an adjoining closet with great privacy and speed the comrade of the intercepted one also shrinking into his nest with similar discretion mr tetterby when he paused for breath found himself unexpectedly in a scene of peace my little woman herself said mr tetterby wiping his flushed face could hardly have done it better i only wish my little woman had had it to do i do indeed Mr. Tetterby sought upon his screen for a passage appropriate to be impressed upon his children's minds on the occasion, and read the following. It is an undoubted fact that all remarkable men have had remarkable mothers, and have respected them in after-life as their best friends. Think of your own remarkable mother, my boys, said Mr. Tetterby and know her value while she is still among you he sat down in his chair by the fire and composed himself cross-legged over his newspaper let anybody i don't care who it is get out of bed again said tetterby as a general proclamation delivered in a very soft-hearted manner and astonishment will be the portion of that respected contemporary which expression mr tetterby selected from his screen johnny my child take care of your only sister sally for she's the brightest gem that ever sparkled on your early brow johnny sat down on a little stool and devotedly crushed himself beneath the weight of moloch ah what a gift that baby is to you johnny said his father and how thankful you ought to be it is not generally known johnny he was now referring to the screen again but it is a fact ascertained by accurate calculations that the following immense percentage of babies never attain to two years old that is to say oh don't father please cried johnny i can't bear it when i think of sally Mr. Tetterby desisting, Johnny, with a profounder sense of his trust, wiped his eyes and hushed his sister. "'Your brother Dolphus,' said his father, poking the fire, "'is late to-night, Johnny, and will come home like a lump of ice. What's got your precious mother?' "'He is mother and Dolphus too, father,' exclaimed Johnny. "'I think.' "'You're right.' returned his father listening yes that's the footstep of my little woman the process of induction by which mr tetterby had come to the conclusion that his wife was a little woman was his own secret she would have made two editions of himself very easily considered as an individual she was rather remarkable for being robust and portly but considered with reference to her husband her dimensions became magnificent nor did they assume a less imposing proportion when studied with reference to the size of her seven sons who were but diminutive in the case of sally however mrs tetterby had asserted herself at last as nobody knew better than the victim johnny 
who weighed and measured that exacting idol every hour in the day. Mrs. Tetterby, who had been marketing and carried a basket, threw back her bonnet and shawl and, sitting down, fatigued, commanded Johnny to bring his sweet charge to her straightway for a kiss. Johnny, having complied and gone back to his stool and again crushed himself, Master Adolphus Tetterby, who had by this time unwound his torso out of a prismatic comforter, apparently interminable, requested the same favour. Johnny, having again complied and again gone back to his stool and again crushed himself, Mr. Tetterby, struck by a sudden thought, preferred the same claim on his own parental part. The satisfaction of this third desire completely exhausted the sacrifice, who had hardly breath enough left to get back to his stool, crush himself again, and pant at his relations. "'Whatever you do, Johnny,' said Mrs. Tetterby, shaking her head, "'take care of her, or never look your mother in the face again.' "'Nor your brother,' said Adolphus. "'Nor your father, Johnny,' added Mr. Tetterby. Johnny, much affected by this conditional renunciation of him, looked down at Moloch's eyes to see that they were all right so far, and skilfully patted her back, which was uppermost, and rocked her with his foot. "'Are you wet, Dolphus, my boy?' said his father. "'Come and take my chair and dry yourself.' "'No, father, thank ye,' said Adolphus, smoothing himself down with his hands. "'I ain't very wet, I don't think. Does my face shine much, father?' "'Well, it does look waxy, my boy,' returned Mr. Tetterby. "'It's the weather, father,' said Adolphus, polishing his cheeks on the worn sleeve of his jacket. "'What with rain and sleet and wind and snow and fog, my face gets quite brought out into a rash sometimes, and shines it does, oh, don't it, though?' Master Adolphus was also in the newspaper line of life, being employed by a more thriving firm than his father and co to vend newspapers at a railway station, where his chubby little person, like a shabbily disguised cupid, and his shrill little voice, he was not much more than ten years old, were as well known as the hoarse panting of the locomotives running in and out. His juvenility might have been at some loss for a harmless outlet in this early application to traffic, but for a fortunate discovery he made of a means of entertaining himself, and of dividing the long day into stages of interest without neglecting business. This ingenious invention, remarkable like many great discoveries for its simplicity, consisted in varying the first vowel in the word paper, and substituting in its stead at different periods of the day all the other vowels in grammatical succession. Thus, before daylight in the winter time, he went to and fro in his little oilskin cap and cape and his big comforter, piercing the heavy air with his cry of, Morning paper! which about an hour before noon changed to, Morning paper! which about two changed to morning pippa, which in a couple of hours changed to morning popper, and so declined with the sun into evening papa, to the great relief and comfort of this young gentleman's spirits. Mrs. Tetterby, his lady mother, who had been sitting with her bonnet and shawl thrown back as aforesaid, thoughtfully turning her wedding ring round and round upon her finger, now rose, and divesting herself of her out-of-door attire, began to lay the cloth for supper. "'Ah, oh, dear me, dear me, dear me,' said Mrs. Tetterby, "'that's the way the world goes.' "'Which is the way the world goes, my dear?' asked Mr. Tetterby, looking round. "'Oh, nothing,' said Mrs. Tetterby. Mr. Tetterby elevated his eyebrows, folded his newspaper afresh, and carried his eyes up it and down it and across it, but was wandering in his attention and not reading it. Mrs. Tetterby, at the same time, laid the cloth, 
but rather as if she were punishing the table than preparing the family supper, hitting it unnecessarily hard with the knives and forks, slapping it with the plates, dinting it with the salt cellar, and coming heavily down upon it with the loaf. "'Ah, oh, dear me, dear me, dear me,' said Mrs. Tetterby. "'That's the way the world goes.' "'My duck,' returned her husband, looking round again, "'you said that before. "'Which is the way the world goes?' "'Oh, nothing,' said Mrs. Tetterby. "'Sophia,' remonstrated her husband, "'you said that before, too.' "'Well, I'll say it again, if you like,' returned Mrs. Tetterby. "'Oh, nothing. There. "'And again, if you like. Oh, nothing. There. "'And again, if you like. Oh, nothing. Now, then.' Mr. Tetterby brought his eye to bear upon the partner of his bosom, and said in mild astonishment, "'My little woman, what has put you out?' "'I'm sure I don't know,' she retorted. "'Don't ask me. Who said I was put out at all? I never did.' Mr. Tetterby gave up the perusal of his newspaper as a bad job, and taking a slow walk across the room with his hands behind him and his shoulders raised, his gait according perfectly with the resignation of his manner, addressed himself to his two eldest offspring. "'Your supper will be ready in a minute, Dolphus,' said Mr. Tetterby. "'Your mother has been out in the wet to the cook-shop to buy it. It was very good of your mother so to do. You shall get some supper too very soon, Johnny. Your mother's pleased with you, my man, for being so attentive to your precious sister.' Mrs. Tetterby, without any remark, but with a decided subsidence of her animosity towards the table, finished her preparations, and took from her ample basket a substantial slab of hot peas pudding wrapped in paper, and a basin covered with a saucer, which on being uncovered sent forth an odour so agreeable that the three pair of eyes in the two beds opened wide and fixed themselves upon the banquet. Mr. Tetterby, without regarding this tacit invitation to be seated, stood repeating slowly, "'Yes, yes, your supper will be ready in a minute, Dolphus. Your mother went out in the wet to the cook-shop to buy it. It was very good of your mother so to do.' Until Mrs. Tetterby, who had been exhibiting sundry tokens of contrition behind him, caught him round the neck and wept. "'Oh, Dolphus!' said Mrs. Tetterby. "'How could I go and behave so?' This reconciliation affected Adolphus the Younger and Johnny to that degree that they both, as with one accord, raised a dismal cry, which had the effect of immediately shutting up the round eyes in the beds and utterly routing the two remaining little Tetterbys, just then stealing in from the adjoining closet to see what was going on in the eating way. "'I am sure, Dolphus,' sobbed Mrs. Tetterby. "'Coming home, I had no more idea than a child unborn.' Mr. Tetterby seemed to dislike this figure of speech, and observed, "'Say than the baby, my dear.' "'Had no more idea than the baby,' said Mrs. Tetterby. "'Johnny, don't look at me, but look at her, or she'll fall out of your lap and be killed, and then you'll die in agonies of a broken heart and serve you right. No more idea I hadn't than that darling of being cross when I came home. But somehow, Dolphus—' Mrs. Tetterby paused and again turned her wedding ring round and round upon her finger. "'I see.' said Mr. Tetterby. I understand. My little woman was put out. Hard times and hard weather and hard work make it trying now and then. I see, bless your soul, no wonder. Adolph, my man, continued Mr. Tetterby, exploring the basin with a fork, here's your mother been and bought at the cook-shop, besides peas pudding, a whole knuckle of a lovely roast leg of pork, with lots of crackling left upon it, and with seasoning, gravy, and mustard quite unlimited. Hand in your plate, my boy, and begin while it's simmering. Master Adolphus, needing no second summons, received his portion with eyes rendered moist by appetite. 
and withdrawing to his particular stool, fell upon his supper tooth and nail. Johnny was not forgotten, but received his rations on bread, lest he should, in a flush of gravy, trickle any on the baby. He was required, for similar reasons, to keep his pudding, when not on active service, in his pocket. There might have been more pork on the knucklebone, which knucklebone the carver at the cook-shop had assuredly not forgotten in carving for previous customers, but there was no stint of seasoning, and that is an accessory dreamily suggesting pork and pleasantly cheating the sense of taste. The peas pudding, too, the gravy and mustard, like the eastern rose in respect of the nightingale, if they were not absolutely pork, had lived near it. So upon the whole there was the flavour of a middle-sized pig. It was irresistible to the Tetterbys in bed, who, though professing to slumber peacefully, crawled out when unseen by their parents, and silently appealed to their brothers for any gastronomic token of fraternal affection. They, not hard of heart, presenting scraps in return, it resulted that a party of light skirmishers in nightgowns were careering about the parlour all through supper, which harassed Mr. Tetterby exceedingly, and once or twice imposed upon him the necessity of a charge, before which these guerrilla troops retired in all directions and in great confusion. Mrs. Tetterby did not enjoy her supper. There seemed to be something on Mrs. Tetterby's mind. At one time she laughed without reason, and at another time she cried without reason, and at last she laughed and cried together in a manner so very unreasonable that her husband was confounded. "'My little woman,' said Mr. Tetterby, "'if the world goes that way, it appears to go the wrong way, and to choke you.' <laughs> "'Give me a drop of water,' said Mrs. Tetterby, struggling with herself. And "'Don't speak to me for the present, or take any notice of me. Don't do it.' Mr. Tetterby, having administered the water, turned suddenly on the unlucky Johnny, who was full of sympathy, and demanded why he was wallowing there in gluttony and idleness instead of coming forward with the baby, that the sight of her might revive his mother. Johnny immediately approached, borne down by its weight, but Mrs. Tetterby holding out her hand to signify that she was not in a condition to bear that trying appeal to her feelings, he was interdicted from advancing another inch on pain of perpetual hatred from all his dearest connections, and accordingly retired to his stool again and crushed himself as before. After a pause, Mrs. Tetterby said she was better now and began to laugh. "'My little woman,' said her husband dubiously, "'are you quite sure you're better? "'Or are you, Sophia, about to break out in a fresh direction?' "'No, Dolphus, no,' replied his wife. "'I'm quite myself.' With that, settling her hair and pressing the palms of her hands upon her eyes, she laughed again. "'What a wicked fool I was to think so for a moment!' said Mrs. Tetterby. Come near, Adolphus, and let me ease my mind and tell you what I mean. Let me tell you all about it. Mr. Tetterby, bringing his chair closer, Mrs. Tetterby laughed again, gave him a hug, and wiped her eyes. You know, Adolphus, my dear, said Mrs. Tetterby, that when I was single I might have given myself away in several directions. At one time, four after me at once. Two of them were sons of Mars. We're all sons of Mars, my dear, said Mr. Tetterby, jointly with Pars. I don't mean that, replied his wife. I mean soldiers, sergeants. Oh, said Mr. Tetterby. Well, Dolphus, I'm sure I never think of such things now to regret them. "'and I'm sure I've got as good a husband "'and would do as much to prove that I was fond of him as—' "'As any little woman in the world,' said Mr. Tetterby. "'Very good,' 
very good. If Mr. Tetterby had been ten feet high, he could not have expressed a gentler consideration for Mrs. Tetterby's fairy-like stature. And if Mrs. Tetterby had been two feet high, she could not have felt it more appropriately her due. But you see, Dolphus, said Mrs. Tetterby, this being Christmas time, when all people who can make holiday, and when all people who have got money like to spend some, I did somehow get a little out of sorts when I was in the streets just now. There were so many things to be sold, such delicious things to eat, such fine things to look at, such delightful things to have. And there was so much calculating and calculating necessary before I durst lay out a sixpence for the commonest thing. And the basket was so large and wanted so much in it. And my stock of money was so small and would go such a little way. You hate me, don't you, Dolphus? Not quite, said Mr. Tetterby, as yet. Well, I'll tell you the whole truth pursued his wife penitently, and then perhaps you will. I felt all this so much when I was trudging about in the cold, and when I saw a lot of other calculating faces and large baskets trudging about too, th that I began to think whether I mightn't have done better and been happier if I hadn't. The wedding ring went round again and Mrs. Tetterby shook her downcast head as she turned it. "'I see,' said her husband quietly. "'If you hadn't married at all, or if you had married somebody else.' "'Yes,' sobbed Mrs. Tetterby. "'That's really what I thought. "'Do you hate me now, Dolphus?' "'Why, no,' said Mr. Tetterby. "'I don't find that I do as yet.' Mrs. Tetterby gave him a thankful kiss and went on. I begin to hope you won't now, Dolphus, though I am afraid I haven't told you the worst. I can't think what came over me. I don't know whether I was ill or mad or what I was, but I couldn't call up anything that seemed to bind us to each other or to reconcile me to my fortune. All the pleasures and enjoyments we had ever had, they seemed so poor and insignificant. I hated them. I could have trodden on them. And I could think of nothing else except our being poor and the number of mouths there were at home. Well, well, my dear, said Mr. Tetterby, shaking her hand encouragingly. That's truth, after all. We are poor. "'and there are a number of mouths at home here.' "'Ah, oh, but Dolph, Dolph!' cried his wife, laying her hands upon his neck. "'My good, kind, patient fellow, when I had been at home a very little while, how different! Oh, Dolph, dear, how different it was! I felt as if there was a rush of recollection on me all at once that softened my hard heart and filled it up till it was bursting.' All our struggles for a livelihood, all our cares and wants since we have been married, all the times of sickness, all the hours of watching we have ever had by one another or by the children, seemed to speak to me and say that they had made us one, and that I never might have been or could have been or would have been any other than the wife and mother I am. Then the cheap enjoyments that I could have trodden on so cruelly got to be so precious to me, oh, so priceless and dear, that I couldn't bear to think how much I had wronged them. And I said, and say again a hundred times, how could I ever behave so, Dolphus? How could I ever have the heart to do it? The good woman, quite carried away by her honest tenderness and remorse, was weeping with all her heart, when she started up with a scream and ran behind her husband. 
Her cry was so terrified that the children started from their sleep and from their beds and clung about her. Nor did her gaze belie her voice as she pointed to a pale man in a black cloak who had come into the room. End of part one of chapter two.